Special Envoy, four years of war nearly now in Syria. You have this freeze plan, and I know there are lots more pieces to put in place. But if you could get this freeze in one district of Aleppo, what would it mean for Syria? 220,000 people killed, one million wounded, feeling of despair and nothing can be done. That's exactly the feeling in Syria at this moment. So a dim of hope makes a big difference. Secondly, it's not just a district. If you heard carefully what actually I was authorized to say yesterday, it is a commitment to stop all aerial bombing, all artillery shelling all over the city of Aleppo. And then we will focus with the aid in one district to prove that this is makes a difference. The problem is, will this happen? As you know, all of these issues can be very tricky. Look at Ukraine today. And secondly, will the opposition understand also that it is in the interest of the people not do mortar shelling or rockets, which will then break this type of hope? You talked about the commitment by President Assad. Yet this is a man who, in some of his recent pronouncements, has seemed almost delusional, saying that there is no barrel bombing by his regime. Can you trust President Assad? You see, the UN, and my job, is to actually give a chance to every opportunity to reduce the violence in Syria and therefore try to find an entry point for some type of political process. The problem is not my trust, it's the lack of trust between the sides. They don't trust each other. And therefore, in a way, the formula I've been proposing, in a way, bypasses that. It is the President Assad in the government of Syria who is actually responding to a request from the UN, not from the opposition, to actually halt all aerial bombing in order to allow the UN to do what they hope to do to help the people in Aleppo. You said that the final announcement on the freeze would come from Damascus. And as you were briefing the Security Council, a fresh offensive north of Aleppo by the, the Syrian government. There is a perception, perhaps, that President ha Assad has some control over this process. He can keep up his offensive and then decide to have a freeze at a time of his choosing. Well, there are two comments to that. First of all, I'm going very fast, quickly, back to Damascus because, as you know, the devil is in the detail and I have no illusions that there will be a lot of uphill work here. But I'm in Harry too. We all are in Harry. Second, you know very well that uh, every time there is a rumor of any ceasefire in history, there is an acceleration, unfortunately, of everyone trying to take a better position before there is a ceasefire. And three, what's happening now around Aleppo and elsewhere is one stark reminder that, in fact, this dim of hope needs to be pushed. You know that you haven't yet got all the opposition groups to sign up, only the Syrian government. You don't know whether the Syrian government will keep its word. What do you think are the chances of success? I have a, a terrible chronic disease, which I've been trying to treat for many years, uh, for the last 43 years, frankly. Um, and uh, I'm not succeeded yet. It is chronic optimism. And uh, I will therefore always try to see, even in a dim of hope, the chance to push forward. If either of the sides, in fact there's more than two sides in this as you well know, don't stick by the deal you do, already you say you have a deal with the Syrian government, what will you be asking the Security Council to do at that stage? For example, if President Assad reneges on the commitment that he's made to you. You see, the first judgment will not come from me or the Security Council or from certainly Secretary General on that. It would come from the people of Syria. The people of Syria will be judging those who are, have been given a chance to actually stop the most egregious form of destruction, which is the bombing, mortar, shelling, and not doing so, and not giving the chance to the UN to bring finally some more aid to the people who have been two and a half years sieged in Aleppo or in four years all over the country. Then it will be up to the Security Council to make his own uh, uh, analysis. But the first judgment is the people of Syria. And trust me, they are just saying, please, han halas, kefaya, we have suffered enough. We just are unlucky to be in the wrong place and we are being bombed. 
you have said that this freeze plan is no substitute for an overall political settlement. Are you still working on the basis of that Geneva communique in 2012? You see, what is important is remember that uh, there is no military solution to this conflict. The tragedy or the paradox is that while we all agree and everyone I talk to feel the same, there is like an automatic machine going on as if uh, in reality they all continue, most of them, I would say all, continue to pretend that it's true. No political solution, no military solution, only political, but meanwhile the machine goes on. But is the end game that Geneva communicate, because I ask you, because that, that point is important, that called and it was agreed by the whole international community for a transitional governing body with full executive powers, control over the defence and intelligence apparatus of uh, Syria, and it had to be established by mutual consent. That means the consent of all the opposition groups. That means, ultimately, if you're still working to that, no future role for President Assad in, in the long term in Syria? You see, the uh, final uh, format of what would be the future of Syria has to be decided by the Syrian people. But it's already let in this communique. Do you let agree me, with the communique? Let me get to that point. The communique, the Geneva communique, which was unanimous, is actually the only paper which has been agreed upon by everyone, at least uh, in, the, in, the, in that context, is the framework which we continuously maintain as a framework. But at the same time, did at the time of that, did we have uh, ISIS in the area? Are we going to be pragmatic in it? Are we respecting the reality that Syrians have to discuss it? I think that is what we have to leave up to them. Would you agree though, Special Envoy, that the terms of the Geneva communique are pretty clear? And if you are going to have mutual consent on a transitional governing body, then there is no future for President Assad. You're never going to get consent from any of the opposition groups, whichever one you talk to, to him having a role. I would leave it to the Syrians to discuss this and to see whether today and tomorrow when there will be hopefully a discussion, and I hope there will be a debate among them. That's why we need the opposition to come up with a common line. That's why Moscow meeting was so useful. That's why Cairo meeting was so useful, so that they can come up with a realistic, pragmatic approach where we stand today. Do we want to continue this conflict? Do we want to have a discussion about a political process in line with the Geneva communique, but also pragmatic? Leave it to them. I'm not going to impose it to them. I'm not going to tell them what to do. But uh, certainly we're going to do anything we can to facilitate the process. My final question to you. One diplomat told me they thought your chances were super slim. What would you say at this time to the Syrian people? That uh, my chances, uh, I hope, are not super slim because that will in a way also reflect the chances of the Syrian people to see hope at the end of this tunnel. But one thing I can tell them that uh, the UN will never give up on the Syrians.